When I was a kid, shock sites were one of the most interesting things about the internet. The prospect of being able to visit a website and see something morbid, which you can't find anywhere else, was fascinating for me and my friends. It's a taboo that many of us experienced. This also heavily contributed to a lot of early creepypasta culture. Many an internet horror story was found to be largely based in snuff film legend. Websites like The Gauntlet and videos like the BME Pain Olympics were mentioned in passing as infamous pieces of gross shock content. So, where did all the dedicated shock sites go in recent times. Once a staple of the internet, as the webs become increasingly sanitized, we've reached the point where all the shock sites that once horrified viewers are no longer functional. Most recently, we've seen the shutdown of LiveLeak, which quietly closed doors earlier this month. And, while most hate to remember their legacy in any way, they undeniably played a huge role in those early years of the internet. So today, I'm going to be examining their complete rise and fall in an attempt to catalog the end of an era for one of the web's most revolting and essential sites. But firstly, it's worth explaining what exactly these websites were for the far more fortunate viewers. To put it simply, shock sites were pages intended to offend and disturb. This usually entailed some pretty gross imagery, from the notorious Goatsy image to Two Girls One Cup. They gained immense popularity in the late 2000s as people enjoyed watching their loved ones witness two women enjoying each other's chocolate ice cream in disgusting detail. What the hell? Get out of here, jockey! Unorthodox fetish videos weren't the only ingredient, however. On the more disturbing side of the trend were videos showcasing extreme acts of violence, fittingly nicknamed gore videos. Unlike the former examples, which for the most only incited pure disgust, the latter had a sense of morbid curiosity to it. That may sound weird to say out loud, but there's a scientific basis for this. Research by the University of Central Florida found that viewers had difficulties turning away because they were so captivated by their own disgust. Initially, these sites tended to be one-off gags, a domain you could send to bait and switch your friends, but others sought to create something greater with the concept. Entire platforms dedicated to documenting that graphic footage with a tinge of humor to trivialize the fragility of human life. This idea would be first realized all the way back in 1996, with the launch of the web's first shock gallery, Rotten.com. If there's one thing I've learned in my time online, it's that you can't control how people act on the internet. In fact, attempting to do so will often lead them to do the exact opposite, with users misbehaving just to spite those who wish to control them. This brings us to 1995, when Congress passed the Communication Decency Act of 1996, a bill meant to regulate indecent and offensive imagery. This was in response to the rapid rise in popularity of online pornography. Many will cite this as one of the earliest instances of attempts to govern the internet, though ultimately, it wouldn't succeed. Despite receiving a majority vote, the vague wording was deemed too restrictive, and thus it was ruled unconstitutional, as it would likely infringe on the First Amendment. In light of these legislative efforts, a computer engineer under the pseudonym of Soylent Soy Boys. decided to protest, creating a site that embodied everything the busybodies feared. That site would be titled Rotten.com, the original shock site, the first place on the internet to collect the aftermath of car crashes, failed attempts by people to take their own lives. You get the idea. It immediately spread by word and ingrained itself in the internet mythos, as those growing up at the time recalled sharing it around school with their friends. Declaring itself as pure evil on its front page, accompanying those horrific scenes were comedic editorials to provoke as much of a reaction from passerby as possible. Though some images had questionable authenticity, most of the site's content was collected from documentaries, news footage, and other pre-existing sources, which were simply ripped and re-uploaded. This would become their strongest defense that the content had been released prior, and Rotten was simply concentrating the horrors sprinkled throughout our lives. The site quickly received the extreme backlash that it desperately desired. Legal threats from brands whose products were seen in videos on the site, as well as relatives wanting sensitive photos taken down, became so frequent that an entire section was dedicated to ridiculing them. One of their first significant controversies occurred in 1997. Following the death of Princess Diana, Rotten published an alleged photo of the fatal car crash. Though aware the image was miscaptioned, they decided to cap anyways, accompanying it with her face photoshopped to have tire tracks over it. The hoax actually generated so much controversy that it received news coverage, which the site owner responded to in a press release. While the photograph had not been tampered with, a few minor points were wrong. We confirmed the source of the image within 12 hours, but because of the wide interest in the existence of any such image, real or not, we went live with it. At no point did we actually claim the photo was genuine. Of course, once we receive a genuine photo of the accident, 
it will get published. Much in the way that shock rockers and radio hosts of the time grew popular due to their infamy, Rotten only capitalized on their bad press by doing their best to piss off the world around them. Accumulating over 3 million views in its first year, by 2001 they were serving over 200,000 unique visitors every day. With massive spikes for particularly controversial editions, they notoriously were the first to publicize photos of the falling man, titling it Swan Dive. Given its origin in protesting regulation, it's no surprise regulators began to cite it as justification for their cause. In 1999, they returned with the COPA, which required all controversial material to be censored for minors. Donna Rice Hughes, who testified before Congress on the issue, denounced Rotten.com in her testimony, calling it an exemplar of the violent and bloody horrors children must be protected from online. Additionally, the site's mixture of both true and intentionally false information led law enforcement to begin investigating their content. As an attempt to fail safe against potential shutdowns, Rotten complied with requests to add content warnings to their site. They even even made attempts to emphasize its educational value, though this wasn't greatly successful due to their past hoaxes. Bonsai Kitten was a shock site centered around the fictitious experiment. It instructed readers how to malform cats into the shape of jars, similar to a bonsai tree. The hoax managed to receive so much backlash that it was dropped by service providers twice, before Rotten decided to adopt the site and host it themselves. Consequently, all their domains were legally blocked by ISPs in Dusseldorf. Over the years, the site faced a number of lawsuit threats. While there are really too many to count, one important example would be when the site operators purchased the domain trenchcoat.com, being a reference to the Trenchcoat Mafia of school tragedy fame. This domain, however, would only redirect to the Burlington Coat Factory webpage, which, as you can imagine, was pretty upsetting for the brand. Later on, they were also ordered by the US government to remove their fuck of the month section. While they complied, they replaced the page with a message antagonizing the feds and criticizing the Bush administration for censorship. In 2005, they temporarily shut down several of their sites in light of new pornography regulations. In many ways, this would mark the beginning of the end. Though they claimed to have a greater educational purpose, this defense was honestly pretty weak. Critics at the time compared it to reading Playboy for the articles, or in modern terms, watching porn for the plot. It was difficult to defend, as the content was all editorialized, and as mentioned before, they deliberately spread misinformation to their audience, getting a major kick out of it. Rotten also cited the footage being circulated prior as a defense but did little to justify their own usage. For a site like this to have longevity in any way, it would need to be more impartial in order to survive the waves of scrutiny. Updates on the site would slow down until 2012, where they were stopped entirely. Then, in 2017, the site quietly went offline because of hardware issues. Due to a lack of public interest, it never returned to the web. So, why exactly did Rotten fall out of popularity, especially as such a titan of the early online world? Well, as the internet became more populated, Rotten stopped being at the forefront of their niche. This was because a massive competitor arose that was able to address those concerns and replace it as the internet's go-to shock gallery. Launched at the turn of the millennium as Augrish.com, they initially copied Rotten's framing of challenging the viewer. They even sported the tagline, Can You Handle Life? Their earliest controversies were also similar in nature, publishing photos from the September 11th attacks alongside hate speech. But unlike Rotten, they eventually had enough sense to drop the satirical nature, instead focusing on being consistent and authentic to their visitors. Augrish not only updated far more frequently, but also had a team constantly prowling the internet for new material. This first entailed what you'd expect, the typical kinds of videos as mentioned prior. But then, everything changed in 2003 with the Iraq War. In the wake of massive overseas combat, Augur subsequently became an archive for the battlefield's most violent scenes, as they began running code scripts to scrape videos and pictures from extremist sites run by enemies of the state. In 2004, the site was receiving 300,000 hits every day, with 750,000 during peaks. This status wasn't without scrutiny, of course, especially when they began reposting execution footage filmed by the captors. This became such a recurring trend that new sites began directly crediting them, with some of their videos receiving up to 15 million downloads. An entire article was even written in 2006 titled Shock and Gore, describing the direct impact they were having on the battlefield. According to this, many people stationed overseas would often refresh the site for updates on ongoing hostage situations. They did their best to justify their usage, however, distancing themselves from the label shock site and instead framing Augrish as an alternative news source for those willing to watch what no one else will. In the article, 
The only public facing member of the site commented, Just as people are increasingly bypassing the authority of their doctor and looking on the web for a diagnosis, they are also turning to the internet in search of alternative views about current affairs. This effectively made their branding and message more in line with something like Infowars than Rotten. However, this somewhat mature stance would ultimately culminate in the abrupt shutdown of the site in October of 2006, redirecting instead to their self-proclaimed Tamer project. The intent with the Live Leak rebrand was to make it more accessible to the general public. This meant further sanitizing it of hate speech, and even changing its tagline to the far more reflective, Uncover Reality. As they continued attempting to push transparency to its absolute limit, they naturally continued to face controversy after controversy. Less than a few months after its launch, the site received a massive influx of attention for hosting the leaked cell phone footage of Saddam Hussein's execution. Live Leak differed from Augerish in several ways, but the most fundamental difference is that it was now a video sharing platform. Rather than having a team curate everything submitted, it was much closer structurally to YouTube. Users could now upload videos themselves, and there was no specification it even had to be graphic. This decision was likely made in part as legal protection to further avoid editorial responsibility. If you do not claim to moderate your site, then why would you have to worry about what users who you don't associate with do on it? It's not your responsibility, right? Regardless of the attempts to pivot, they remained most well known for what made them famous with the White House press secretary at the time even naming it as the best place to see updates from active soldiers. While this framing allowed the site to gain more legitimacy and eventually outlast its competitors, it too would manage to hit its ceiling. In the summer of 2014, Islamic State terrorists filmed themselves beheading an American journalist and uploaded it to video sharing sites, including YouTube, Facebook, and LiveLeak. After pressure from both the media and their peers, the company caved in and updated their policy to ban all beheading footage produced by ISIS. It's one thing to republish footage scraped from other sites. It's entirely another to host content uploaded by the perpetrator themselves, inviting accusations of condoning or even encouraging attention seekers. Interestingly, two years prior, a minor competitor known as Bescore faced similar backlash regarding the Luca Magnata case. They were heavily criticized for continuing to host the murderer's home video of the crime, which he debuted on their platform, contributing to him reaching the fame that he so desperately wanted for the kill. The site owner was later charged and pled guilty for obscenity. This question would arise once again in 2019 following the New Zealand mosque shooting. The perpetrator streamed the entire massacre online, forcing platforms to redefine their position on the matter entirely. Facebook and YouTube began using advanced algorithms and digital fingerprinting to prevent further spread of the video. Reddit went so far as to ban several subreddits, such as Watch People Die, and once again, LiveLeak 2 complied, refusing to host the video and comparing it to the glossy promo videos for ISIS. They later elaborated on their justification in a statement. We've received no small number of complaints regarding the fact that we will not carry the video. As a result, we've decided we put out a statement explaining why we've taken this stance. Whilst we may carry media that shows the most terrible of events, we don't want to be a vehicle of choice for those who carry these events out. This was a very important distinction for us. Currently, judging by media coverage and reactions online, he's getting almost exactly what he wanted. We don't intend to indulge him further. We've never had a show everything policy and will continue to review certain items on a case by case basis. We fully understand some people will be very unhappy with this decision, but as with previous decisions, we will stand by it all the same. We hope you can understand our position on this, even if you disagree. All of these were signs of the end, as in general, it appeared that the site's administration had lost interest in continuing to host it. In June of 2020, the ability to log in was disabled entirely, preventing any more content from being shared. Then, nearly one year later, in May of 2021, the site was closed down permanently, with the domain now redirecting to their supposed next project. And with the death of LiveLeak, it truly signified the end of an era. Reading through their final statement, the justification for why the site was closed makes little sense. In fact, it actually says very little, only serving to promote its replacement. Item Fix appears to be just another clone of YouTube, and specifically outlaws all of the content that made its predecessor so famous. There's no reason for anyone to use this, and I don't see it lasting any more than a few years. Interestingly, the aforementioned Best Gore also shut down a few months prior. It too had an equally vague farewell, only stating that its founder had moved on to pursue different endeavors.
There's been so much speculation as to why both of these sites shut down, and if there's any connection between the two. I personally don't have a good answer, but some have posited that there could have been some third-party pressure unbeknownst to the public from behind the scenes, spawning many a conspiracy theory. Alternatively, it's possible that they simply became unprofitable, or that it was too difficult to keep service providers due to their content. According to an interview with one of the site's founders with Input Magazine, the decision was merely a move to the next project. The vision could evolve no more, and therefore, he ended it. Probably best to just take his word for it. Regardless, it's safe to say that their reign in the online world is over, or at least how they used to exist in the past. Moving forward, it's going to be really interesting to see how their diminished presence affects social media and future news coverage. There is genuine value to documenting that footage somewhere, something even recognized by news publications during LiveLeak's prime. Disturbing as it may be, it's a part of life and it's a part of history. Perhaps we will see the resurgence of these sites someday. But if we do, please don't let me know by sending me that shit. Just kidding. Okay, okay, don't, don't, don't. Just, just don't. I've been Turkey Tom. Thanks for watching, and until next time, leave me alone.